All right, well, good afternoon. Um, so again, <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about the new standard that uh, OSHA has put into place regarding confined spaces in construction. And our purpose for today is obviously we want you to have some uh, improved understanding of what this new standard is all about, including you know some of the requirements for working uh, at a site where one of the uh, confined spaces is present. We're going to talk about some definitions, uh, what is a confined space, uh, among other things. We're going to talk about the training that's required, and also uh, what are some of the duties um, of people who are working on these job sites uh, in or around confined spaces. And then we'll also be able to provide you with a checklist for implementing a safety-focused confined space policy, so you'll have an idea of just how you can implement this program and do it correctly. And then also we want to make sure that we're answering some frequently asked questions regarding uh, the confined spaces rule. And I'm, I'm sure that there will be uh, several of those out there. Uh, one note that I do want you to make sure that you know, you're aware of is this is, as Drew uh, said, this is an overview of the new standard. And by no means is this considered a confined space entry training uh, to make you an entrant or an attendant or a supervisor. Um, or someone who's able to perform rescue from a confined space. So again, just want to make sure that you're clear that if that is something, you know, you're going to have employees or maybe yourself is going to be doing any of these particular roles, you'd have to have a specific training uh, just for each one of those uh, duties that you have to have. And again, we're going to go through some of the requirements for that here as we move through the program. All right. So I just want to give you, um, you know, some of an, uh, an outline of what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. So we're going to look at a little bit of background as to why this uh, standard was even put into place. Again, look at some definitions, some responsibilities that uh, people have, as well as companies, and who, in fact, is in charge of this the uh, location where there may be a confined space. We'll talk about classifying each confined space because there are several classifications. We're going to look at training requirements. Uh, we'll have a whole section just on rescue and where we have to be with that. And then we'll look at, uh, you know, where this all started and where we currently are as far as the timeline goes. So the background, so confined space entry for construction. So there's a lot of requirements for this new standard. Um, many of them are the same as the general industry standard. So any of you who have been out there and have actually been into a, a factory, uh, so we're looking at the general industry uh, arena, they have had a confined space standard for years and years, and they've been required to follow that. Uh, so this is nothing new as far as safety goes, but it is new uh, for a lot of us in the construction arena. Uh, they couldn't simply just take the general industry standard though and move it over to construction and say, here, follow all the same rules and guidelines, because there's a lot of you know, unique characteristics in the construction world that really make the general industry uh, standard. It, it really doesn't apply well at all. Some of the rules just aren't covered in there under general industry because of, of the differences in how you, know, you go to general industry, you go to a factory, and that environment basically stays the same day in and day out, uh, but not so for construction, as you all know. They actually began working on this uh, standard in 1993 and it's taken them until now, or until last year actually, uh, to actually get it up and implemented and in place. And now you know, we're expected to follow these rules and guidelines. Uh, enforcement, that started October 2nd um, of last year. So that's when the program was officially implemented and OSHA can begin, begin holding companies accountable for making sure that their employees are following all these new rules and guidelines. And again, the main purpose of that is what? So we can protect our people, make sure they all get home at night, and then obviously we don't want to be cited either. So there's certainly uh, reasons to want to be following these new standards. So how did we base this need for having to have a construction standard uh, as far as confined spaces go? Because they went really for years without one. And for the most part, if you were working in a confined space in construction and you were found to be doing something that OSHA would deem unsafe, they could really pretty much cite you under the general duty clause for that, because they really didn't have anything to cite you under specifically for confined spaces. And that's now all changed. But how they came up with a reason for wanting to change this is they looked at the fatality and accident data that was available for construction workers 
who were out there on job sites where a confined space was uh, on site. Guys were working in them, people were working around them, and they were looking at, you know, who got hurt, uh, were there accidents and incidents. So they, they used some of that data. OSHA was out looking at these job sites, um, looking at the different, again, violations that were occurring. So even if it was just noted under general duty standard, they're looking at the experience as far as, okay, what have people been cited for in working around these confined spaces? So really, what are the big health and, and, uh, and injury concerns that we were really worried about? And then they also took some advice from advisory committees for the you know, construction and safety and health uh, councils. They're out there looking at you know, the information that these groups had as well, and that's how they came up with uh, the standard that's now in place. So as I said, the previous construction standard really didn't adequately protect employees. It's some of the things that we you know, have deemed that really weren't being looked at well enough to protect people were you know, atmospheric hazards. So were the atmospheres, was the air being tested before people were actually going into these spaces? Or once they were in the space, were there things being done now all of a sudden we have a bad atmosphere? Or maybe we didn't when we started, but now all of a sudden that has changed. Mechanical concerns. Things weren't locked out properly. So guys are in, there could be fans or, or any kind of turning, moving equipment um, that could suddenly start up or someone start them up accidentally. Energy is released. Nobody even knows that there's a guy working in there. And then there's just all kinds of other hazards. Could be something like, you know, there's fall hazards. Um, as we start to approach summer, you know, heat. So, you know, we could have guys working in these confined spaces. Um, they're overcome by heat exhaustion, heat stroke. So we're looking at all these other hazards that could potentially be in play, and then we need to be protecting our employees from that. So what they came up with, uh, you know, looking at statistics, were you know, annually there's about six deaths and, you know, there were 967 injuries. Now, that's a lot of deaths and injuries being, you know, these are happening in these spaces, and we need to figure out how we can do something about that. So OSHA's plan, by implementing this standard, if their numbers look to reduce this by 90%. So if we can reduce 90% of those numbers, you know, that would be certainly well worth everyone being on board and really wanting to follow these rules and guidelines and protect your employees and, and get everybody home at night like we want to. Some of the big concerns in construction, you know, some areas that make it so much different than general industry, so we can't just take their standard and slide it over and say, okay, it applies for construction. Because if you think about it, you know, there's a lot of employee turnover in the construction world. So we've got guys might work for nine, 10 months, and then they're off, and then they come back, and we've constantly got people coming and going, multiple work sites. So we've got guys working on this site today, maybe they're here for two days, and then they're someplace else for two days, or maybe they're here for a month, and then they're off, and then they come back. So there's, you know, multiple work sites are going on all over the place in construction. And all these sites are just a little bit different. And then we have short-term tasks. So we have people who are going in to do some work. Maybe they're only going to be going into a pipe to do some work for an hour or two. Uh, but how long does it take to get somebody seriously injured or worse can get killed? It certainly takes a lot less time than an hour or two. You know, it can be a matter of seconds. Um, so we're constantly worried about you know, just an employee saying, well, I'm only going to be in there for a minute. Therefore, I don't need to follow the standards. Not true. You know, it's got to be taken care of immediately. Time cannot be something that you take into account to say whether you do or do not need the standard. If you're going into a space, considered a confined space, you have to follow the rules and the guidelines. These spaces are constantly evolving, whether it's because of the work that the actual entry employee is doing, so they're changing the space themselves, um, or maybe it's something that another contractor outside the space is doing that's changing the dynamics inside the space, whether it's they're turning a switch on and now all of a sudden we've got a motor running that wasn't running before or they're operating a generator and now they're producing fumes that weren't there initially. So those spaces are constantly changing. And we have multiple contractors and controlling contractors on site. So these people, we need to make sure that we are actually communicating with everyone so that everybody knows who's doing what. So we don't have somebody in a space working and all of a sudden another contractor shows up and they begin work. And they may not even have any idea that somebody is down in a tunnel someplace and their actions are now going to potentially cause them to get into a hazardous atmosphere or something's going to start up that shouldn't have. 
And then workers are just plain unfamiliar with confined space hazards. They may not know about air monitoring, um, a lockout tagout program. You know, I find this all the time when I'm doing my trainings. A lot of people are just very unfamiliar with the hazards that they may encounter in a confined space. So a part of the training that has to be given to all employees who are entrants or attendants or supervisors is, you know, they need to be aware of confined space hazards and, and look for potential hazards at all times while they're working in or around those spaces. So let's look at some definitions, right? So what is a confined space? And some of you may have already worked around confined spaces and you may know exactly what that is. I all the time get people asking me, what is a confined space? So they really don't know the definition. So if we look at the definition of what is deemed as a confined space, it has to be big enough to get into, you know, so get in there and actually do some work. It has to have limited access. Now this one, uh, I have heard some confusion on this where I've had people actually say to me, well, you mean one way in, one way out, right? And I said, well, no, that's not what it means. It means it's limited access because I actually had one company say, well, we got rid of our confined space because we took two ladders and put it into the space. So now we've got more than one way in, one way out, so it's no longer considered a confined space. Not true. So a ladder is still considered to be a limited source of access. And then the third criteria would be it's not designed for continuous occupancy. So if you look at the photo that's on the screen there, you'll see a couple of guys who are working down in some kind of a, kind of a manhole of some type. And as you can see, that certainly meets the criteria. So it's big enough for them to get into. It has limited access because they've got to crawl down this real skinny ladder. And then it's certainly not designed for continuous occupancy. So that's not going to be someplace that somebody goes to work every day. They're in there doing some maintenance work or maybe some repair or some construction. But it's not set up to be someplace where they would go every day to go to work. So we get into some different kinds of confined spaces though. So that's the definition of a confined space. Well, now we need to look at what is considered a permit required confined space. And this kind of, this ups things a little bit. So now we're looking at more of a, a hazardous space to have to go into. So it has to meet all the criteria of a confined space. So again, it's gotta be big enough to get into. You have to be able to, you know, it's got access, is limited, and then it's not designed for you to be in there. But it would also then be considered a permit required confined space if it has one of the following that are there on the list. So it has a hazardous atmosphere or it, uh, it has the potential to have a hazardous atmosphere that ventilation is not going to be sufficient to properly control. It could have inwardly converging or sloping or you know, tapering surfaces that could trap an employee. So if you're thinking about, uh, let's say, like a hopper bottom of some type where the floor sloped down, and a guy could actually slide down and be trapped in the bottom and he can't get out. So we consider that as our, our tapered surfaces or an engulfment hazard. So if we're thinking about an engulfment hazard, it usually most people think about engulfment that the first thing that comes to mind is water. But it doesn't necessarily have to be water. And there are other things out there that can engulf you. So basically cover you up. Um, you know, any fine solids or materials uh, I personally know a guy whose father uh, walked across the top of a bend that was full of oats, and the oats had crusted over during the winter time. And when he got to the middle of it, the crust gave way, and then he fell down through the oats. And then they all they all came in and covered him up, and uh, he was not able to get out. And the poor man suffocated while he was uh, in this oats bed. So again, that would be an engulfment hazard. So you go down, and, and it comes in over top of you, and you can't breathe, so the guy suffocated in oats. Um, so that would be, a, 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 you know, there's numerous engulfment hazards. You need to be thinking about those. Other existing hazards, hazards could be things like explosives, um, types of energy, including mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, or pneumatics, uh, falls, radiation, temperature extremes, and even noise. So these can all be considered additional hazards and then would make that space what we call permit required. The other type of space that we could get into next would be what we uh, have termed as an alternate space. So an alternate space is initially a permit required confined space, but the only hazard that's present is a, uh, a poor atmosphere. But we can control that atmosphere through ventilation, so if that's something we can accomplish, then we could reclassify that to what we call an alternate space. But again, you have to be very careful that that's the only hazard in there. 
So we can't have anything that's a potential engulfment or you know potential that uh, somebody could flip a switch and turn something on. If the only thing that we can be potentially worried about is bad atmosphere, then we can make that an alternate space. And we're going to go through a little bit more about that um, coming up. So they do want to talk about the different entities, so the different players who would be on a site where a confined space is present. So if we're going to have what we call the host employer, so this would be the employer that owns or manages the property where the construction work is taking place. So just last year, I had to go to a one of our local colleges, and they were doing some addition work on there, and they had hired a GC to obviously you know, get the work going, and then that GC was going to hire some subcontractors. So in that case, the college then was the host employer. And then we had our, our general contractor, he would be the controlling contractor, because he had overall responsibility for the construction at the work site. And then the entry employer, so at the point where I mean, we got involved in this, uh, because of a confined space issue, is they had um, a company that was going to come out and do some pipe insulation. So they were actually going to be the, the people that were going down into this tunnel to do some work. So they would then be what we call the entry employer. So they're actually having their people go down and do some work. So how does this concern you? So, you know, confined spaces and construction, you know, we need to be looking at, is this something that you need to be concerned with and, you know, get a program in place or not? So let's take a look. So who's covered by the standard? Employers who engage in construction work with confined spaces at their job site. Now, notice it doesn't strictly say that you have to be going into the confined space. It says if there's a job site that you're working at and there's a confined space there, then you and your people, you know, you're involved because we want to make sure we're protecting everyone, whether they're going into the space or not. And then obviously employers who hire subcontractors to operate within those spaces or you're telling your people that, okay, here's the work we have to do, these are the spaces we've got to go into, then certainly you're going to be covered by the standard. And things that would be considered as confined spaces, you know, we have a whole list of them here, it would be bins, manholes, tanks, sewers, transformer vaults, storm drains, manholes. So there's all kinds of things out there. Again, you got to look at where your employers are working and determine, hey, does that meet the standard? You know, is that... Does that criteria exist where I'm sending my people? Is that a confined space? And if it is, what kind of a confined space is it? There are some exclusions out there. So OSHA has looked at a couple of different um, chapters, I guess you will call them. There's, there's subparts in 1926, which is the construction standard. So things like diving and non-sewer activities and excavations. Okay, so they're covering these in, in the subparts, so diving subpart Y. Excavation subpart P and OSHA is deemed that they've already protected against these in those subparts, and, and we really don't have to go any further under certain circumstances. So, if you think about a trench box, a trench box certainly would meet the criteria for a confined space. Um, if you look at what it what it is, so it, you know, can you get your whole body in there? Absolutely. Can you know, is it limited access? Sure, you got to have a ladder, and is it designed for uh, continuous occupancy? No, those things are moving constantly. But what OSHA has said is, you know what, as long as it's just an excavation like that, you know, subpart P covers the hazards and we're not concerned with it. But if you were in an excavation and suddenly you drop down into a storm sewer that's live, well, now you're going to be covered by the new confined space standard because the excavation standard wouldn't be adequate enough to cover all the hazards that could potentially exist there. So let's look at some responsibilities for work in confined spaces. So again, if we go back to our example of our uh, of the college that I went to, you know, this being the host employer, um, they had to provide the following information to my general contractor. So they had to, you know, tell them, hey, here's each known permit required space that we have on site. Here are the hazards and potential hazards that we're aware of within that space, and then here's the precautions that we've already taken to protect those spaces, to keep people maybe from getting into them or, you know, working around them. So the host employer has to, to talk to the controlling contractor about what they already know about that space. And then the controlling contractor, so in this case, you know, the general contractor, they have to review what information has been given to them by the host employer, and then they provide that information to each entering employee or others whose activities could create a hazard within the space. 
So as I already alluded to earlier, this is really all about communication. So it's not just somebody comes on the site and starts doing some work around a confined space or in a confined space. Everybody on site has to know what that confined space is and who's going to be in there. So we don't harm people, you know, inadvertently even start to do some work that's going to potentially or certainly, you know, again, not intentionally hurt someone, but unfortunately we don't have communication and that can happen all too often. And then if the entry employer, you know, somebody who's actually going to have employees going in and working in these spaces, as you can see, there's a lot more responsibilities uh, when you are actually the entry employer. So you have to be aware of the controlling contractor's information. So you're going to you need to have meetings ahead of time um, to determine what the space is all about, what hazards are present, um, inform the controlling contractor of the space of the, the confined space program that you're actually going to follow. So if you have employees who are going to have to enter a confined space, you're going to have to have a confined space entry program that you're following that, you know, talks step by step how you're going to protect your employees while they're in or around those spaces. And then the controller, excuse me, the entry employer would have to uh, make sure that they're preventing unauthorized entry. So only those people that are supposed to be in that space are actually going in there. Identify what acceptable entry conditions are, are present, what's going to be allowed, we have to change, uh, what's, what's right, what's wrong. Identify and evaluate permit space hazards prior to entry. So critical that we know ahead of time, so we're doing an evaluation of that space to see what those hazards are. If we can eliminate the hazard, absolutely. Or if we can control the hazard, then we have to do that. If we can't control it, then we need to figure out what we can do before we just send our employees in and you know, putting them in harm's way when we don't need to. As the entry employer, we also need to provide the entrance with the opportunity to observe any uh, monitoring or testing of the spaces. So if I'm the entrant, I certainly have the right to look at what the uh, air monitoring showed, and that way I'm knowing, hey, I've got enough oxygen. Or wait a minute, there's too much oxygen in this space. You know, I don't want to go down in there because it could ignite and I could, you know, end up, you know, catch on fire. So we need to have those people who are going in the space. They have the right to look at that testing and see what things are all about. Isolate any physical hazards. So again, maybe we have to implement a lockout tagout program. Um, so again, we need to be very aware of the training that's required for something like that. So you can't just lock a piece of equipment out. Uh, again, you have to be going through the proper training and your employees have to know the hazards around uh, locking a piece of equipment out, or not locking a piece of equipment out for that, as far as that goes. Provide and test ventilation systems needed to eliminate or control the atmospheric hazards. Provide protection from hazards outside the space. And then provide early warning systems for what we are called non-isolated engulfment hazards. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. The entry employer must also designate and train employees um, who have active roles in the entry process and then develop a procedure for summoning and rescue. So if something happens to someone that's in the space, how are we gonna get them out of there? Train employees on the rescues of attempting entry hazard. Unfortunately, uh, if we look at the fatalities in confined space work, and we can go back to general industry and, and again, what they've looked at for previously in construction, um, and there's more than half of the fatalities for confined spaces are the would-be rescuers. So it's people who see someone who go down in a confined space and they feel that they can go in and rescue them. And unfortunately, you know, they become another victim at that point. So uh, down uh, south, uh, mid-southern Illinois, uh, there was a confined uh, pig operation and the father of this uh, family farm, um, they he went down in this space to do some cleaning and drops. His older son sees dad go down laying on the ground, so he immediately goes in after him to see if he can help dad. He falls. The next brother sees his older brother and dad laying down in the bottom of this pit. He goes in. He falls. Finally, the hired hand who was on site sees it and goes, you know what, there's a problem here. I'm not going in there. And he calls the fire department. The fire department shows up. And uh, the end of the story is that all three of those uh, gentlemen were overcome by methane and all three of them died. So again, they, one after the other just went back, you know, went into this space and then they all became victims. 
So we have to really be sure that we're training our employees that they can't go into these confined spaces as hard as it would be to stand outside of it and watch. Um, they can't go in and be a rescuer because they could become the next victim. And then once we have uh, completed our confined space work, the entry employer has to review all the canceled permits. So annually, they have to go over their, their canceled permits or their closed permits and then look at their program and see if it is in fact working or if there's revisions that need to be made or is it a program that, you know, we're really up on this, looks good. But every year that these things have to be reviewed to make sure we're spot on with this because of how many, you know, injuries and deaths do occur in these spaces. So we have to classify our confined spaces so we know exactly what we have to have into place before we start working in them. So in order to classify them, we have to do an assessment for each one. And then once we have done our assessment, looked at the hazards, we can come up with uh, one of three classifications. So it can either be a permit required space, it can be an alternate procedure space, or it can be a non-permit required space. In order to figure out what any space is, the first thing you're going to have to do is conduct air monitoring. So when you're conducting your air monitoring, you know, what you're looking for with that is you're looking for your oxygen levels. If they're too low, obviously, you know, you're not going to be able to breathe and you could have a guy who could suffocate um, because there's not enough oxygen. If there's too much oxygen, then that can become a flammable environment. So we need to know what our oxygen levels are. We're looking for combustible gases. So, you know, are there gases in there that could explode? Are there fumes that are being, you know, we're creating because of the work that we're doing or that they're coming in from some other uh, location and entering in the confined space where we happen to be working? And then we're also looking at toxic gases. So things like hydrogen sulfide or uh, carbon monoxide. So we're looking at these types of toxic gases as well with our monitors. And then monitor periodically and as necessary. And that's really going to be determined on what type of space it is, and just how serious are the levels that are in that particular space that we're worried about. So if you've decided and, and determined, I should say, that through your assessment, yes, in fact, you do have a permit required confined space, um, this is the most serious of the confined spaces then as far as hazards go, you know, we have to have an attendant outside that space at all times. And the role of this attendant is to constantly be monitoring how the work is going inside the space and be in communication with the entrance. And then that way, if something happens, either inside or outside the space, they would be the person who would alert those entrants and tell them that, you know, they got to get out. Um, and just as, as, a, as a point that doesn't get often made often enough, if the attendant says it's time to get out, it's time to get out. And, you know, anybody can tell people that they need to get out of a confined space. If they see a hazard, you know, they can be telling them as well. But the attendant has to be on duty and outside the space at all times. Also, in a permit space, you have to monitor continuously for non-isolated engulfment hazards using an early warning system. Now, this is something that, uh, you know, this is not something that you're going to find in the general industry standard. And uh, this has come from uh, deaths that have occurred where employees are working in a confined space, a tunnel, storm sewer, where there may be water in place, and for reasons that people are not uh, aware of, all of a sudden the water rises and these individuals in these tunnels are swept away and they end up drowning. And there's been several instances of that, uh, especially in our around the city of Chicago. We have the, the uh, tunnel system up there for getting rid of the storm water, and there's gates all over the place that open up without warning. You know, they're not telling everybody, hey, we're going to open up the gates. And then we have a rise in water, and it can, uh, it can wash an entrant away. So we have to have some way of telling people, hey, the water is rising. we got to get people out of there. Ways we can do that, we can post an observer upstream. So you have to have an individual who literally sits and watches to see whether the water is rising or not or we can use a detection or monitoring device upstream that will then alarm us uh, in the event that the water begins to rise. And that way we know we got to get people out of there and we got to get them out of there quickly. Other things for permit required spaces, uh, for authorized entry. So we have to limit it, number one. So again, only authorized employees can be going into those spaces. 
And because you were authorized on the last job, certainly doesn't mean that you're going to be authorized again for this job. That is determined by the entry supervisor. So the supervisor is going to be the guy who says, hey, today you're going into the space or today you're going to be the attendant. And then that would be, you know, determine who's authorized to go in there. We need to install warning lines and post danger signs so employees and other people are on, who are on the site are aware that, hey, this is in fact a confined space. I need to stay out of there. We have to inform employers and the controlling contractor on what measures we're now using to limit that entry by unauthorizing people. Uh, complete arrangements for rescue of employees. And again, we're going to talk about rescue here in just a little bit. And then what training is required for the specific duties that uh, you may be doing as uh, someone who's working around a confined space or in a confined space. So training. Who has to be trained and in what? Well, you have to be trained to be an entry supervisor. You have to be trained to be an attendant, to be an entrant, and then you also have to be trained um, to be a rescue uh, person. So there's some confusion out there also over the years that all fire departments have people who are trained in confined space rescue, and that's not accurate. Uh, some fire departments, some of the smaller ones, actually do not have anyone who is trained in confined space rescue. So you'd have to find another means of, or another source who would do your rescue for you. And we'll talk about that here shortly. We also want to train people on how to respond in the event that non-entry rescue fails. Uh, we train everybody on the dangers of performing rescue, of uh, going in there, and again, you becoming another victim. And all of this training has to be completed prior to entry. So we can't go to a job site and say, you know what, we'll get everybody here, and then at lunchtime, we'll do the training. It all has to be done before the training or before the entry ever even occurs. And then we also have to receive training if there's any type of a new hazard that may be introduced. We have to complete our permit. So what's on our permit? Well, the permit includes conditions that would enable safe entry. So we're looking at isolation methods. We're looking at you know, all the means that we're using to protect our employees while we're in there. We're looking at air monitoring. So we've got to set up our air monitoring. The reason we're doing this is we want to be able to detect any increases in uh, atmospheric hazards. And then we want to be able to also know that you know, if we do detect an atmospheric hazard, do the attendants or excuse me, the entrance have sufficient time to actually exit. So if we're using ventilation to control a hazard and the ventilation system fails, can we get a person out? So these are things that we need to be thinking about. Some other initial tasks that need to be done for permit spaces is we have to, again, we have to identify them. Once we have them identified, we have to post danger signs, the permit required signs, or permit required space, you know, do not enter. And if no employees are on site that are going to be entering, well, it doesn't mean we can just leave that space alone. We then would have to uh, erect barriers to keep people out. Again, we're posting danger signs, and we have to inform all employees on site that, hey, this is a confined space, and you need to stay away from that. Photo on the, the slide right now shows you um, an example of a confined space entry permit. So again, these have to be written, so it's the documentation that shows exactly what you're doing to protect your employees. It also shows who's in there. So we have a, a space where you will actually list who the entrants are. We have a space to list who's the attendant and who's the supervisor. So we want to keep an accurate head count of who is going in and who is coming out of that space. And that's one of the jobs of the attendant is they keep a count of who's actually in there. So we know if something happens, everybody's out or, oh, we've got a guy left in there. Now we've got to get somebody in here to get that person out. The next space that we look at was what we called a, uh, an alternate procedure confined space. And an alternate proce procedure, as we discussed earlier, means that the only hazard that I'm worried about is uh, potentially or a bad atmosphere. If we can control that atmosphere through ventilation and there are absolutely no other types of hazards that we're concerned with, we could deem this as then an alternate procedure. So if it's an alternate procedure, then we don't have to have an attendant there at all times. Um, it does have to be documented. You have to show that you know, you, you've taken all the steps. Um, you can prove that, in fact, that there are no other hazards present. It's strictly the, uh, the atmosphere, and that ventilation has controlled that atmosphere, and you'll know that by being able to document your air monitoring results. Alternate procedure also says that employees must not enter the space until forced air ventilation has been established. 
and we have to make sure that if it if it stops, we get everybody out of there, and you know, we can't just be using any old air, I guess, to say to to ventilate. So we have to make sure that our air supply is coming from a clean source. So we certainly wouldn't want to set up our fans or our blowers um, next to someone who just fired up their generator, and now we're actually forcing carbon monoxide into a space. So we got to make sure that our air supply is from a clean source. We have to provide continuous air monitoring so we can look and make sure that, hey, you know what, we said that we could control this, and in fact, we can document that we are controlling it. And then we also need to make sure that, again, if, if that ventilation stops, we have enough time to get our employees out of there and get them out of there safely. And then the last type of space would be what we call non-permit. So a non-permit confined space, so you've been able to determine that you can isolate all the physical hazards, you can remove them. Um, those are not going to be a concern any longer for the people who are working in the space. And you have to be able to isolate those from outside the space. If you had to go into the space to, let's say, perform some type of lockout tagout, you would have to initially open that space as a permit required space. Then once you've you know, locked it out, now you've eliminated the hazard, now you could reclassify that into an, uh, a non-permit space, but it would have to start out as a permit required space. Documentation is also required for all of this to show that this is why it's a non-permit space. And then employees who are entering that space, you know, they need to be trained that you know, once we're going in here, we need to be looking at what the potential hazards could be. And then if something pops up that, you know, we thought we had control and all of a sudden we don't, they need to know what those hazards potentially could be so that they can get out of there before it becomes dangerous to them. Um, and employees in or near the space must also be trained in the hazards of, again, performing this entry rescue. So as you can see, we hit that a lot because of how many victims we have who are trying to attempt rescue and then they end up getting hurt themselves. You may at some point in time have to reassess that space. So initially you thought, hey, I can turn this into an alternate procedure or I can even make this a non-permit required confined space, but you may have to do a reassessment of that space. So ways that this would, you know, types of time, things that would make this change, um, maybe you're doing some kind of new work. So initially it was a, a space with no atmospheric hazard and now you're doing some cutting work. Well, now you're generating fumes with the use of a cutting torch. So maybe you have to reassess and say, yeah, we're going to have to make this an alternate space now. You're using new materials, which may actually be producing fumes of some type. There's been new information received that, hey, you know what? You didn't, you didn't get this uh, locked out up here. Um, did you forget about that? So that could potentially be a problem. Or all of a sudden, you see water start to coming into the space. And where did that come from? So we may have to do a, a reassessment on that. When you do a reassessment, everybody has to come out of the space, right? So we don't want people coming in uh, their space looking for things um, one, while people are still working. We got to get everybody out, and that's when we do our, our reassessment. If we've had unauthorized entry, so we've got people coming in there that weren't supposed to be in there, well, how'd they get in there and why? So we'd have to reassess at that point in time. Um, detection of any other hazard that, uh, that exceeds what we had planned initially, or certainly if somebody gets hurt or God forbid there's a death or a near miss, we want to get everybody out of there and reassess to see what the problem is in that space and how does that even happen, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about training. So training requirements, okay, so all training must be documented. So the old statement that I truly uh, believe in that if it's not documented, it never happened. So you can say all you want that you've done your training, but unless you have it documented, um, you're going to have an awful hard time proving that. We may have to retrain employees. So when would we have to retrain? Well, if we've, we're looking at employees, we're watching their work, and they're deviating from the entry procedure. So we've told them what they need to do, how they need to be safe, and all of a sudden they're going in and they're doing things and they're not following that. We're going to have to retrain them. Maybe they don't have the knowledge that we thought they had, Maybe it was the training wasn't adequate, or maybe they just didn't pick up on it. In either, any case, we're seeing them you know, going away from the procedure. We're going to have to do some retraining. As far as the requirements for the training goes, it has to be in a language that the employee can understand. So we can't bring people into a class. We teach it in a language that most of the people understand, but I think probably all of us have been to a training where there's a couple guys sit in the back of the room, and the instructor says, does everybody understand? And everybody shakes their head yes, 
knowing full well that, you know, a couple guys in the back of the room just didn't get it. So we can no longer say that that's adequate training. We got to make sure that these people, they get the training and more importantly, that they understand the training, all right? And this has to be done before their first assignment. So again, we can't say we'll do it after a day and make sure that, you know, you can handle being down in this confined space before we take the time to train you. It has to be done before their initial assignment. If their duties change, maybe we train some guys to be in attendance, um, and now all of a sudden we want them to be an entrant. Well, we need to make sure that they've had that proper training as well. Or if there's a change in permit space conditions, maybe there's a new hazard present that we need to let people know about, uh, we need to make sure we're doing some retraining at that point as well. Any evidence of deviation from the procedures or inadequacies in the employee's knowledge, got to get them retrained. And then again, we have to maintain these training records to show that we have, in fact, actually done it. All right, some other things, you know, employers are required to provide and train on the use of the following equipment. So atmospheric and uh, monitoring equipment. So if you're the attendant and your foreman has said to you, hey, you know what, you're going to be monitoring the air here today, you know, we need to make sure that you know and understand how that air monitor works. What levels are you looking for? How do you document uh, those, uh, those numbers when they do come up on the, uh, the machine? If it, start, if it shuts off, why did it shut off? So there's all kinds of things that we need to have you know about your atmospheric um, and monitoring. Forced air ventilation. So if you're the attendant, you're watching the fans, you need to know how those hoses go in, making sure that, you know, that, uh, that fan stays away from, again, somebody who's doing some kind of work that's going to now produce some kind of a fume that could be harmful to the entrance. You need to know how to use the PPE that you've been assigned to, uh, and this certainly includes respirators. So if uh, an employee is required to wear a respirator to go into not only a confined space, but at any time, your employer has to wear a respirator. And we make sure that everybody knows that to wear a respirator, number one, you have to be medically cleared, and then you have to be fit tested, and you also have to have training. So there's still way too many people who are out there wearing respirators who think that they could just, you know, I think I know what I'm doing there for, I'll put it on, and, and they have not gone through their program at all. So if you've got guys wearing respirators, make sure that your respirator program is very much up to date. And then any other safety equipment that may be needed for the job. So here in this picture that you can see, you know, these are all things that can be used for confined space entry. Um, and we have the big one there in the middle is the tripod. So, you know, a portion of our non-entry rescue may be, in fact, that we have to have a tripod set up in place. And, you know, it'd be pretty important that the guy who's up on top is going to be monitoring people and told that, hey, something happens, you need to get them out of there. They, in fact, know how to use that tripod and that winch system on there and get them out. All right, so rescue. Let's, uh, let's look at that real quick. So there's two types of rescue for confined spaces. So there's non-entry and there's entry rescue. Now, obviously, because of what we already talked about uh, several times now, is that you go into the space and then you, uh, you become the next victim. Non-entry rescue is certainly our preferred method of getting someone out of a confined space. So when we look at a non-entry rescue system, you know, it's a retrieval system that can be used by the attendant. So they're getting a person out of that space without ever having to enter it. Now, again, that's the preferred method for obvious reasons. So non-entry retrieval systems include things like a full body harness, uh, a retrieval line, and then attached to a mechanical or retrieval device or fixed anchor point. So your full body harness, you know, obviously you can have a line hooked up to that, and then that line needs to be hooked up to something outside the space, and it needs to be to a fixed anchor point. And the reason that we've got a retrieval line on there is obviously if it's a horizontal entry that we can uh, we can um, go into, or, you know, the guy goes into the space and then we want to get them out of there very quickly because something's wrong, we can grab that rope and we can pull that individual out of that space, right? And the reason that it has to be hooked up to something you know, behind them is because we don't have, so we've got a, a 30 foot tunnel the guy's climbing into horizontally and we've got 20 feet of rope. Um, so what happens is he, he car, crawls all the way in and now all of a sudden he's 10 feet in, well, there's, there's no rope that's even available to grab him for about 10 feet. So we got to make sure it's hooked up something outside so they don't get too far. And as far as vertical rescue goes, if you're going into a confined space 
that's over five feet in depth, now we have to have a way to hoist that person out of there. And the power for that has to be through human power. Okay, so it has to be, again, you could use a tripod, um, you could use uh, a winch system that hooks on the side of a, uh, a trench box, or maybe um, a jersey barrier. So we're going to be able to take that, and then we're going to be able to, to use a handle, like you've probably seen these on, on the uh, tripods where you crank the guy out of there that way. You can't use a backhoe. You can't use a crane or, or uh, an end loader. You know, you're going to hook something up to that and say, that's how we're going to get the guy out. Because we have to be able to feel that resistance. If that guy gets hung up on something as we're trying to get him out, if you got that hooked up to a backhoe, you know, you're going to get half an inch run out. So we're going to, we got to make sure that it's, it's human power. And then the attendant needs to practice with this retrieval device. So on some of these systems, you know, there's a button that you have to push in order to get that to go into retrieval mode. So it's very important that this guy knows, or girl, knows how to use that prior to a person dropping into his face. And then other equipment that may be out there would be something like um, wrist lifts or ankle straps. Um, and you'd use these if, uh, if you got um, a space where you know, a harness is really not something that's going to be feasible, okay? So entry rescue. This is what happens when, for two reasons, okay? You get a guy in there and so for some reason your, um, your non-entry rescue system, it wasn't put in place properly and it wouldn't work. Or we need to know what to do with, again, like I just previously said, you're trying to get a person out and all of a sudden he's hung up and he can't get out. So this is when we would have to actually, you know, certainly have rescue. So we have to have people that come there to get the person out, all right? And you can either use a professional rescue service, your fire department, or you can train your own employees to be your rescue team. So a rescue service, so if we decide, you know, well, whoever we're going to use, we have to make sure that before the work starts, that we've had contact with them and that they, in fact, can perform that particular type of rescue and they're available to do it and they agree to do it. So you have to get a hold of the fire department in whatever area you're doing this work, let them know, hey, I'm going to be doing some confined space work over here um, and, you know, are you available to perform rescue? So we got to have, again, we're right back to communication. So you got to have communication with the fire department and say, you know what, Ed, you know, we're going to be doing this. Can you help us out? If they can't, or if you choose to, you can certainly conduct training and get your own entry rescue team. Um, we have actually, at, uh, at Optimum, we've been involved in that. So we did have a, a client where they were kind of out in the rural, you know, far suburbs. We went and talked to their fire department and said, we're gonna, these guys are going to do some confined space entry work. Uh, would you be available to come do rescue for us? And the fire chief basically looked at us and said, we're a volunteer department. We don't have a confined space entry team. So at that point, we had to train these employees to do entry rescue. Um, again, they have to be trained on the equipment. We have to have uh, people trained in first aid CPR. So when they do get somebody out, you know, they can immediately start working on them until we can't get the fire department there, or the ambulance, the paramedics to help us out. And then they have to practice rescue at least once every year. So annually, they have to do a mock rescue. So what this company does is they have a 200-pound mannequin and they throw it down into this confined space and then they go about rescuing this, this mannequin. Keeps them sharp on, uh, on how to use their equipment and just what to do and seeing if the space has, in fact, changed since the last time they were in there. All right. A lot of information. Um, I'd like to open it up now um, to see if anybody's uh, got any questions. Drew? So if we have any questions, just submit them through the chat function, uh, submit them directly to me, and we will answer them as they come in. Um, Jerry, I, I actually uh, have a question already that we had. Um, so who is, uh, do I need to do continuous air monitoring for non-permit confined spaces? Okay, no. So. A non-permit space, so again, uh, as we talked about, you're going to have to do air monitoring for any space, but if you've deemed that there are no, there's no atmospheric hazard that's present or even potentially hazard, or it's not there, and that's going to be a non-space, then you would not have to do it except initially. 
So initially I'll have to do it. So either way, if I'm entering a confined space, I should probably own my own air monitor because initially I at least initially have to make sure everything's good. Absolutely. And know how to operate that thing. Okay. And who would be responsible for conducting air monitoring initially or if it's continuous? Who, what party? You, you had a bunch of different people there, right. entrants and supervisors. Who's responsible? So it would be the entering contractor. So the, the party that's going in there to do the work, they would have to be the ones who would be doing the air monitoring. They could potentially use, let's say, the controlling contractor's air monitor, but they're going to be responsible for doing the air monitoring and making sure that it's documented. Okay, and they would have to be trained Correct. on how to use that air monitor. Yes. Okay, great. So we're, we're getting a question. Um, how often do employees need to be trained for confined space? Um, so when would they need retraining? They should uh, get confined space uh, entry training annually. And then even as far as, uh, so if you're an entrant or an attendant or supervisor, you know, we need annual training. And then um, as far as just even awareness training, we talking about, you know, you shouldn't go in for rescue, do rescue. You know, that could be certainly something that we could do even on a toolbox talk. Um, but it, it would need to be done annually as well. Um, and so you said uh, entrance, supervisor, um, and attendant. Are those three separate trainings then? They could all be done with confined space entry training at, at the same time. So um, I could do all three, and then I could be either an attendant, an entrant, or a supervisor? Okay, so you can be multiple. You can, you can perform multiple duties. Um, so you could, in fact, be the supervisor and you could be the attendant or you could be the supervisor and you could be the entrant but the two things obviously that you couldn't be is you can't be the attendant and an entry person um, and and on that note um, the way the standard reads is that any portion of your body crosses the plane of the entry space you've now just become an entrant and then you'd have to have another attendant on duty so if you're the entrant, you've got to stay out of those spaces. Okay, great. Um, so again, another question here. You talked about calling the fire department to ensure that uh, they could perform confined space rescue. Correct. Um, once, I, once I deem that they can, do I have to call them every time I enter a confined space? As long as you're doing that, you know, so you initially called and talked to them, um, as long as they know that you're working in that area, you, you just have to call them the one time. But you, if you leave, then you're going to come back again. You, know, you have to call them and ensure again that they can perform that rescue. So if I know the city of Smallville has a confined space rescue team and they'll be on site and can respond in a, a good amount of time, uh, and I'm performing confined space kind of throughout that that city, um, and I confirmed with them um, that that they have this capability, uh, and I and I'm entering confined spaces uh, multiple times in a week. Would I have to call them every time before I enter? Not every day. So you would initially contact the fire department. You tell them, okay, I'm going to be doing work on this site in this confined space for the next two weeks are you going to be available so you wouldn't have to call them every day but if you left for a month and then you came back to do some more work before you started again you'd have to ensure that they were still available and could still do that rescue for you okay great um and i think we have time for one more question here um so if the fire department is not available um like your example where they don't they're a volunteer department they don't have a confined space rescue team the closest is 30 minutes away well that wouldn't work um and i really don't want to take on the liability of training my employees to do an entry uh rescue um are there are there other ways to go about this there are you know i don't know of them personally i've never talked to anybody um um face to face but there are other groups out there that will do confined space rescue um, so you could contact a, a source other than the fire department or your own people so you, you may have to do a little digging but uh, but there are other groups out there who are doing confined space rescue so there's other services that are 
trained for rescue, they're certified, and they'll come to your standby attendant and have all the rescue stuff available um, during your operation. Okay, great. Correct. Awesome. Um, I think that's all we have for questions. So um, if, if other questions do come up after uh, this training on confined space or any safety-related questions at all, uh, please feel free to contact FCA's safety helpline. Uh, you have the number up here on the screen. It's 844-414-SAFE. You can also submit questions to safety helpline at finishingcontractors.org. Again, any safety-related questions, uh, confined space, respiratory, whatever the case may be, fall protection, uh, anything safety related, if you have a question, this is a resource for you guys uh, that the FCA has set up. So please contact the safety helpline uh, if other questions do arise. Um, also, I uh, wanted to make everybody aware of uh, FCA's Toolbox Talk program. So FCA uh, has this uh, web-based Toolbox Talk program where it's a library of over 200 Toolbox Talks in English and Spanish. There's also preset 52-week uh, schedules available, um, or you could make up your own schedule, but that is available. Um, this would be about an $800 a year um, service if you went out and bought it on your own, and FCA has this available to its members. So if you're interested, uh, please reach out uh, to Darlene at, um, at the Finishing Contractors. Uh, her email is right there, D-S-H-O-N-D-E-R at finishingcontractors.org. Um, or you can uh, give her a phone call, 866-322-3477, um, and we can get you uh, a free access key for your company. So it would be one login uh, per contractor and then you have access to over 200 toolbox talks. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody uh, for calling in today and joining the Confined Space for Construction webinar. Uh, these webinars, we'll have them uh, quarterly, all on new safety topics. Um, so hopefully we'll be uh, seeing you next quarter. Thank you. Thank you.